Hi everyone, let's try and make this molecule. The key functional group that I'm going to need to focus on is an allylic amine. And also today, I fancy imposing some other conditions on my synthesis. As we have a stereocenter, I'd like to make just one enantiomer, and I'm going to force myself to use catalytic asymmetric techniques. So as is common in retrosynthesis, if I'm trying to make an amine, a good way of doing a retrosynthesis would be to think about reductive amination. For example, going via an imine. So perhaps I should try and make a molecule like this which of course I could make from the parent ketone. This would just be some condensation using an ammonia equivalent in mildly acidic conditions. But we start to run into a problem when we think about this, because of course the alpha, beta and saturated carbonyl has both a soft electrophilic center in its beta position, as well as the intended hard electrophilic center directly RON2 on the carbonyl. So trying to use an amine, for example, could lead to an alternative product where it's done a 1,4 addition instead. That's because amines are borderline hard soft nucleophiles. But we also need to address how we would make the reduction enantioselective. And that's okay, because common ways of doing this would be to go via the enamine instead. Now, there are two possible enamines that we could form here. So we are going to run into another problem. One of the possible enamines we could use is this one here, where the CC double bond forms on the right-hand side. Or alternatively, it could form on the left. The retrosynthesis plan, for example, would be to add hydrogen across the CC double bond there to set the stereocenter. But we'll note that if we do that in the second enamine, we end up with a problem. The other alkene will be in the wrong place. A very common technique for making amine bearing stereocenters in asymmetric catalysis is to do a hydrogenation of an enamine. But ideally, you need this pattern. So specifically, we put the CC bond that we want to hydrogenate next to an amide instead, because this oxygen can act as a directing center to a metal this will be a metal center with some chiral ligands on it, but also with a hydride ligand, or perhaps two. With careful choice of those ligands, you direct to one face of the CC double bond, deliver a hydrogen, and set the amine stereocenter. Common metal catalysts used in these sorts of systems are rhodium dipamp, dipamp just being a chiral phosphine ligand. And if you use this complex in the presence of hydrogen gas, you can add a hydride ligand to the rhodium center. Another common catalyst uses a ruthenium with a chiral binap ligand instead. And this is essentially doing the same sort of thing. The structure of those chiral phosphine ligands there, you can find on the internet. The mechanism for these types of hydrogenations is quite involved. And I'll do a video on the details in the future. But for now, I just want to focus on the retrosynthesis. If we have a look at the two enamines that we formed before, you can see that we want this top one. But under thermodynamic control, you'd probably get the bottom one. Forming enamines, of course, is under reversible reaction conditions. The reason for this is that the conjugated system in the bottom product is more stable. That's one continuous pi system that you could draw a resonance structure with. That one has linear conjugation. Whereas you can't draw resonance structures to implicate the whole of the pi system on the top molecule. This is so-called cross-conjugated, and it's just less thermodynamically stable. The other thing that's a bit awkward about that top one is that it's got a tetra-substituted alkene, which even though those CC bonds are more substituted, which can help to stabilize double bonds, you're starting to increase the steric strain on a system like this, because on both sides, you've got extra steric clashes in the plane of the paper. So given the choice under reversible reaction conditions, the enamine is less likely to form in that position. So we have a problem here. The pretty much default way of making a nitrogen-bearing stereocenter like this, enantioselectively, won't work but I have a plan. And that's to focus in on the fact that it's an allylic amine. And that gives me an opportunity to do a rearrangement first and disconnect back to something easier to make. If the synthetic planning isn't the thing that you thought you would do, do let me know in the comments below. And just before I carry on, please do subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. If you're enjoying this video, the feedback means a lot to me. Okay then, so pressing on, Getting started on the retrosynthesis. What I'm going to do first is a functional group into conversion, usually abbreviated to FGI, where I'm going to turn the amine into an amide. So I've drawn this amide slightly suggestively, and that's because it sets me up for a pericyclic reaction, specifically a 3 3 sigmatropic rearrangement. I can draw the reverse of what I need with some arrows, something like this. And we can see we have a new functional group down here. Perhaps a slightly less common one, this is a trichloroacetimidate. This functional group often lives in the world of protecting group chemistry, 
but you can do some other tricks with it, including this one. This type of rearrangement process was developed by Larry Overman and his lab in the 1970s. The Ford reaction is named after him, in fact. This is the Overman rearrangement. And just being strategic about our retrosynthesis, we've done something very sneaky here because it allows us to completely change the problem we're trying to solve. We now have an oxygen bearing stereocenter, and there are loads of ways of making those enantioselectively using asymmetric catalysis. So plowing on with our retrosynthesis, I'll just try and convince you that that's a stereocenter that we would get at oxygen that would then transfer to being near the nitrogen. We can draw a transition state for the reaction, which will look something like that. That's CY for cyclohexyl. This will be the lowest energy transition state because we can put the two big groups in the equatorial position. And hopefully what we can see here is that the nitrogen is behind the hydrogen and also the oxygen is behind the hydrogen on its respective carbon. So what we're seeing here is the oxygen being delivered from the back. Okay then, so moving on with our retrosynthesis, I need to make my trichloroacetimidate, which I can do by just disconnecting next to the oxygen like this, because I can make that functional group by direct addition to this trichloroacetonitrile. And now I have an allylic alcohol. My favorite way of making this using asymmetric catalysis would be to do a CBS reduction, which will take me back to the ketone. I have a video explaining how this reduction works in detail, so do check it out when you're done with this one. I've linked it in the description below. Essentially what we're doing here is making a chiral version of sodium borohydride. So what I need is a CBS catalyst based on the natural L-proline and also a hydride source such as BH3. Just to check that that gives me the correct configuration that I want, I can just draw the transition state. The ketone will bind to this complex like I'm just drawing now and will be activated towards nucleophilic attack by coordination to the Lewis acidic boron center. Studies have shown that this transition state is probably a boat shape. The key point being the lowest energy transition state will put the largest group down here where I've put RL and the smallest group up here where I put RS. And that's specifically to minimize any one free diaxial clashing between this butyl group and whatever group is on our ketone. So here it would be bad to put our alkene there because it would jam right into that butyl group. It would be much lower energy to put our sp3 center there because it's smaller in the context of this transition state and just let our sp2 center go out into empty space in the pseudo equatorial position like this. So this transition state shows that on our structure below with the star, we'll get hydride delivered from the front face. Right, that, that's our enantioselective step done. I would be very optimistic about this CBS reduction. These are so easy to do in the lab. The expected EE for a substrate like this would be greater than 95%. I'd also expect a pretty high yield for this type of reaction. And the other great thing about the CBS reduction is the workup is really easy. Strong recommend for you to try it out in the lab sometime. To complete the retrosynthesis, I have an alpha, beta and saturated carbonyl group. There are lots of methods for making these. But perhaps one of the more reliable ones for this sort of setup would be to use a horner wadsworth emmons reaction. That's normally abbreviated to an HWE reaction. So that means I'm going to need to use this cyclohexyl aldehyde and also this beta ketophosphonate. The cyclohexyl aldehyde is commercially available. We could, of course, do this via a Wittig reaction, but the HWE is a bit milder, a bit easier to conduct in practice and also likely to be very highly E-selective. So we shouldn't have any worries about forming any of the incorrect double bond isomer by accident. So to finish this retrosynthesis off, I need to make this beta ketophosphonate. Now there's actually quite a lot of ways of doing this, which I'll just explain. People have their own personal preferences. I guess a classic on paper disconnection is to go here in purple and do a michaelis arzubov reaction that's going to require me to go back to this alpha halo carbonyl and trimethylphosphite. The mechanism there is an SN2 displacement followed by a demethylation to form the phosphorus oxygen double bond. This is normally done with the triethyl phosphite, but the mechanism idea is the same. And then more in our retrosynthesis, we'd have to make the alpha bromoketone, which would just use some enolate chemistry where we should be able to select for the least hindered hydrogen using your choice of irreversible bulky base form an appropriately mild enol equivalent 
and react this with an electrophilic bromine source. We are getting into a bit of a multi-step sequence here, which is fine, but there are alternatives. And to be honest, some of the other ones that I'm about to show you are much, much quicker to conduct in the lab, which means you could just be spending a few hours rather than maybe a couple of days. If you have the chemical available to you, you could actually just do a direct addition straight away using the same purple disconnection and just go directly to this methyl ketone and use enolate chemistry to do a direct addition onto this chlorophosphate. So examples of the reaction conditions there would be one LDA at minus 78 degrees to form the lithium enolate on the position that you want and two add your phosphoryl chloride. The slight problem with this is that the reagent is a bit less easy to handle is a bit more expensive. And depending on your setting, you might not be able to get hold of some of these compounds of phosphorus I'm about to show you, because sometimes they're used in the synthesis of some pretty nasty compounds, such as organophosphorus nerve agents. However, if you're not on a big scale, and if you're in a sanctioned research laboratory, you could well have these things available to you. There's two other ways of making the beta ketophosphonate, and that's to disconnect at this green position instead. And that's because if you're willing to make this acid chloride, it's possible to use this methyl phosphonate, another compound with some restrictions, but you might well have it in a research laboratory. And what you can do here is deprotonate with a strong base, such as butyl lithium, and do a direct addition, and just do an acylation reaction, sort of Kleisen style, I guess. So that would be one, using butyl lithium to deprotonate that proton, has a pKa somewhere in the ballpark of 30, and then two, add your acid chloride, and then you're done. Now here, there's no risk of double addition because both the nucleophile is very bulky. And if we have a look at our beta ketophosphonate product, the beta ketophosphonate has acidic protons, which are more acidic than the one we deprotonated on the methyl group. That means that the product will stay as a stable enolate form and you don't risk adding another nucleophile into that ketone and doing a double addition. Along the same lines, you could also make the aldehyde and use that as the electrophile. So that we're just be using this methyl phosphonate again, deprotonating it using butyl lithium, firing it into the aldehyde this time, the, which will give you the beta hydroxyphosphonate. So we'd need to oxidize it up to the ketone as a third step. And we could just use something easy like desmartin periodinone here, and then you're there. Now I've actually had personal experience with this last route, and this is very operationally easy. You get your methyl phosphonate in one flask, dissolve it up, add the bule, that makes your nucleophile, and then you can add your aldehyde to give you the beta hydroxyphosphonate. You can do a quick workup and filter through some silica just to clean it up a little bit, and then you could submit the crude reaction product without any columns or anything to the desmartin oxidation, which again is just dissolve up your hydroxyphosphonate and just shovel in as much desmartin periodinane as you need to get the reaction to go to completion. Now, for the sake of this retrosynthesis, there's been a bit of a detour. The option I'm going to take is the second one with the orange star here, just because it gives me some slightly nicer compounds to deal with next. This methyl ketone can be quite easily made by conjugate addition. Here I could use the cuprate to do a Michael addition on this electrophile. This is called MVK, methyl vinyl ketone, and it's commercially available. Now this aryl bromide is probably available, but if we really wanted to make it, a final disconnection would be just to brominate in the meta position using standard bromination conditions because that CF3 group is meta-directing. So now I can just sketch out my proposed forward synthesis. I'm starting with trifluorobenzene. I'll use some old school bromination conditions to brominate in the meta position because that will go via the most stable carbocation intermediate. I'm then going to make this an organometallic by treating it with magnesium first to make the Grignard. Then in the presence of a copper one salt, say copper bromide catalyst, I'll react it with methyl vinyl ketone, and that will give me this Michael addition product. I need the beta ketophosphonate next, so I'll treat this with LDA at minus 78 degrees. LDA is this structure. That will form the enolate on the terminal position, and then I'm just going to react it with this phosphoryl chloride. Next, I need to do an HWE reaction. There are lots of different conditions for this one, so I'm just going to use the classic textbook version of this. If you put in some lithium salts, you can just use a milder base. That's the Mansume Rausch conditions. But it's perfectly fine just to use sodium hydride to deprotonate that beta ketophosphonate and then react with the aldehyde I needed, which was this one with a cyclohexyl group on it. 
I'm planning to make a future video on the details of the HW reaction, so do keep an eye out for that in the near future. That should give me this alpha, beta and saturated ketone with very good control of geometry over that carbon-carbon double bond that's just formed. Next, I'm going to use a CBS catalyst to do an asymmetric reduction. So that will be something like this one. This, that will give me this allylic alcohol in excellent EE. Next, I need to make a nucleophile there. So I'm going to use potassium hydroxide to form an alkoxide. And then that alkoxide can find this trichloroacetal nitrile and attack it as a nucleophile. That's going to give me this trichloroacetimidate. Now I need to do the Overman rearrangement next. And because it's a free free sigma tropic rearrangement, I should be able to get away with this with just heating. Just as a reminder, the curly arrows look like this. I'll just note in passing that it's possible to catalyze this reaction using some heavy metals. So e.g. mercury two plus or palladium two complexes. Presumably what that sort of thing does would be to act as a Lewis acid on that pi system just to lower the activation energy for the process. And to finish off the synthesis, all I need to do is hydrolyze the amide and let's just use potassium hydroxide again. And that's my product, hopefully in high yield, high in anti-selectivity with a collection of operationally easy to use reactions. If you enjoyed the discussion, please do give the video a like and YouTube's just gonna pop another video on the screen now that it thinks you might want to watch next.